Over the last 150 years, Jesmond Parish Church has become one of the largest Anglican churches in Britain. Its history tells of an extraordinary work of God who has grown the church whilst the city of Newcastle was being built all around it. But to be ready for the future, we need to understand the past. Our story starts in the 1740s when an evangelical revival swept across the UK led by the preachers Wesley and Whitfield. It was the start of a spiritual revolution. As the revival took hold, a visionary Cambridge vicar named Charles Simeon began training a new generation of biblical preachers to win the nation back for Christ. Among them was Robert Wozney, a fervent young man who in 1808 became the chaplain of St Thomas's Chapel in Newcastle. Wozney preached powerfully. It was said he found Newcastle nearly barren of religion and he left it in possession of a religious and moral influence unknown in its previous history. This influence extended to a well-connected young clergyman called Richard Clayton, who was converted. He took over as the chaplain of St Thomas's Church Haymarket after Wozni's death in 1836, and his ministry was transformed. Clayton was said to possess an unusual sweetness of disposition and largeness of heart, but most significantly preached the three great gospel truths of conversion, justification and sanctification. Under his dynamic leadership, St Thomas's became one of the most numerous and influential congregations in the town. The religious census of 1851 recorded huge Sunday attendances at St Thomas's of 2,336. However, in October 1856, aged only 54, Richard Clayton suddenly died of pneumonia. His grieving congregation immediately became concerned about who would succeed him. Four-fifths of the congregation wanted the successor to be Clayton's assistant, the evangelical Thomas Halstead. However, the town council was responsible for the appointment. In his memorial sermon, Clayton's friend George Fox prophetically remarked, that the day may not be far distant when within the walls of St Thomas's you shall no longer hear the plain message of gospel truth. Within hours of Clayton's death, church members asked the council to select Halstead. Yet despite their wishes, the council chose a man who had previously opposed evangelicals, the high church vicar of Newcastle, Clement Moody. Fearing that Clayton's gospel work was endangered, the St Thomas's congregation planned a new church in memory of Clayton. They saw an urgent need for a central point for the maintenance and promulgation of sound scriptural and evangelical truth in a large and populous town. The leading architect, John Dobson, designed the church and the project needed 8,000 pounds, equivalent to around 5 million pounds today. Donations came from all over the UK. Located at a site in fields near the edge of the city, the building work took a year. At the consecration service in January 1861, the Evangelical Bishop of Durham, Henry Villiers, encouraged the new church, be true to your religious principles, let there be no compromise. Fundamental to the new Jesmond Church was a passion for worldwide mission. In the following years, a number of the congregation, both men and women, went overseas as missionaries at great cost. For example, in 1885, the father of a JPC curate, James Hannington, had been murdered by a local chief named Luba whilst a missionary in Uganda. Undeterred, in 1903, James Hannington left JPC for Uganda. And three years later, news was received that Hannington had baptized the son of Luba, his father's murderer. From the start, JPC had a deep concern for local mission and planting churches. With the population of Jesmond increasing massively, in the 1880s two mission rooms were set up and St George's Church was opened. But by 1900, Vicar Thomas Brokers Waters saw that much more was needed and so in October, 
he launched the Jesmond Church Extension Scheme to raise money to build two completely new churches. Two months later, a temporary building seating 350 was opened in Sandiford, and within just a year, people were actually being turned away on Sundays for lack of space. St. Barnabas' Church, a permanent building, was opened in 1904, followed by Holy Trinity Jesmond in 1905. However, in the first half of the 20th century, two dangerous movements threatened the very life of JPC, liberal evangelicalism and Freemasonry. JPC became the epicenter of liberal evangelicalism in the North, but it simply accelerated decline and church attendance fell dramatically. What's more, despite its fundamental incompatibility with Christianity, Freemasonry also became widespread at JPC, and from 1927 to 59, two JPC vicars, George Goddard and Harry Bates, were active Freemasons. But JPC didn't die. Instead, in 1960, Roger Frith became vicar, a godly man whose top priorities were Bible teaching and reaching the inhabitants of Tyneside with the gospel. In his very first year, the centenary of JPC was a vital reminder of the church's evangelical founding purpose. A mission was held with Dick Rees in 1963, at which many of the congregation made confessions of faith. Evangelism was placed firmly back on JPC's agenda, and a new youth work was begun. In 1973, David Holloway became vicar and gratefully acknowledged that all the spade work had been carried out by Roger Frith. However, because the new central motorway was being built right outside the church, the archdeacon ominously predicted that the church would probably shut within six years. But instead, within a decade, the church grew to over 500. Yet there were plans for further growth. In 1982, David Holloway challenged the church council. We are praying for the church to double. Unless now there are new expectations and sacrifice, we will not grow. We must plan and pray. Many activities and ministries at JPC were started following this. At a wider level, the Christian Institute was founded by members of the church in 1990. And in 1993, David Holloway helped found reform after 15 years on the General Synod working for Biblical Orthodoxy. Over the years, JPC as a whole challenged unbiblical theological liberalism and sadly became an impaired communion with the present Bishop of Newcastle over sexual ethics. Since the 1980s, JPC has doubled, with a poll showing over a thousand different people present on a Sunday. The church attracts people of all ages from right across Tyneside to its services and seven days a week activities. Since the year 2000, the JPC congregation has sacrificially given over three million pounds for mission work in the UK and overseas, and it has active mission partnerships in 14 countries all around the world. Church planting continues too. In 2008, in Gateshead, JPC planted Holy Trinity Church, and now, remarkably, it has Sunday attendances over 250. So what of the future? The founders of JPC built a church in fields at the edge of a large and prosperous town. Their vision was to reach the inhabitants of Newcastle and beyond with the good news of Jesus Christ. Today, the church's plans are just the same. JPC's vision is that in one generation, the church will grow to 10,000 people living godly lives, growing the church and changing their nation, half in Newcastle and half in new churches in this region and around the world. That's a big vision, and only God can make it happen. But as the first 150 years of the life of Jesmond Parish Church clearly show, God is at work.